welcome back, everyone. It is always good to be with you. As we come into the uh, later days of the week, I do want to highlight that, like the last few Fridays, tomorrow's video will be a premiere, so it might pop up a little bit differently, but it should launch at noon unless I manage to flub that up as I did a few things earlier this week. Uh, I also want to just kind of point towards, for those of you who are here in Wisconsin, um, everything's a bit in disarray right now in our state, and um, it's worthy of a bit of prayer and consideration. There's a lot of unknowns and a lot of confusion, and hopefully in the coming days that will get sorted out. I do want to let you know that really here at the church, I don't anticipate it probably changing anything significant immediately. Um, we do, as we mentioned on Sunday, have a team looking into these questions um, and starting to kind of program out how we would reopen and and when and under what circumstances. There's a lot yet to be seen, but the the actions of the county of Wisconsin have have really said that we're status quo for now, at least for another week or so. So we'll continue to see how this plays out. We will make the best and most faithful conversation or decisions we can here for the church. But uh, uh, for the moment, stick with us here online, and we will continue to offer everything we can in every way we can. Um, but for today. I, I want to spend one more day on that group of believers that we've been exploring the last few days. We we started with their prayer for boldness, and then we moved on to that very troublesome scene of Ananias and Sapphira. And today, we round out our exploration of the group with a subset of people known as the Seven. To start... However, we need, we need to remember the context of what's been going on here. This is that earliest community of Christian believers, and they are led by the Twelve, the original eleven disciples plus Matthias, who was chosen earlier in Acts to replace Judas. And their financial structure as a community was one of shared wealth. That was the issue that we saw play out in yesterday's story, but their model was that all resources were brought to the Twelve, who then in some manner oversaw the distribution of those resources. The process and the, the detail of how that played out was all very vague, but a problem begins to erupt in the midst of it all that we hear about in Acts 6 starts out at the beginning of that chapter that during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. Now, I'm going to pause a minute here and build in a little bit of context. The believers at this point were all Jews. The movement into the Gentiles, that effort to convert those who were not of Jewish origin, it doesn't, it doesn't emerge until a bit later in Acts, and we're going to come across that story with Peter next week. Within the Jewish community, however, among other fault lines and distinction, there was something of a division between the Aramaic-speaking Hebrews who had spent their lives in Israel and near the temple and the Greek-speaking Hellenists, who were those of the Jewish faith, who had origins from outside Israel and who were more influenced by the Greco-Roman culture of the time. So remember back to our exploration of the story of Ruth and our discussion of the difficulty and the challenge that faced a, a childish, childless widow who had no male to speak for her or to care for her. They were among the most socioeconomically fragile in the society. So what we have here in this community that's been sharing all of these resources led by the Twelve is some dissension that has emerged between the Hellenists and the Hebrews regarding the support that those Hellenist widows have been receiving. So with all of that in mind, what I actually find most interesting 
is the response of the apostles. It goes on in uh, the second verse and on in the sixth chapter. The twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Ty, Ty, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. I think it's, it's a subtle and yet fascinating detail to note that the apostles didn't solve the problem. Faced with this complaint in their community regarding the allocation of resources that have been laid at their feet, the apostles do not resolve, adjudicate, arbitrate, or really engage in the specificities of that issue at all. Instead, they quickly realize that the management of resources in their growing community requires a degree of tension, attention that they can't provide. They need to be focused on preaching the preaching of the word. They need to be focused on spreading the gospel. They need to be focused on the inspiring of the faith of those in the community and the sharing of that faith with those outside. They're apostles, not bankers. And they know it. So they appoint the seven to take on that role, a group of respected, wise, faith-filled individuals who could put their focus on the fiscal matters while the apostles continued to set their sights on the spiritual. Now, as I am... As I look through this story and I consider the apostles' response, I, I'm reminded that one of those difficult things to learn in life, certainly for me at least, is that we can't be all things to all people. No matter how much we may want to enter into every challenge, every difficult, or every picture or every moment of strife around us, we can't do it all. One of the most common scriptural themes, particularly in the New Testament, is that of spiritual gifts. Again and again, especially in Paul's writings, we are reminded that we have gifts. There are things at which we excel. There are talents and experiences that we can bring into this world that make us particularly suited to enter into certain circumstances with a tremendous amount of impact. The flip side of that coin, however, is that it also means that there are certain circumstances where we're simply not the one to make the difference. Repeatedly over the course of the past two months, I, I know that I've looped again and again around to the notion of stepping into the needs that surround us, and they are many. <clears throat> what was already a societal norm that was filled with extensive need is now a reality of exaggerated despair, <clears throat> excuse me, brought on by this global pandemic that is nothing like any of us have ever imagined. The need around us is not hard to find. I've made that point over and over in this series, and I assure you I will make it again in the weeks and months ahead. That said, it's also important that we step back every once in a while for the reminder of the other side of that coin. We can't be all things to all people. 
even the apostles, those dearest friends of Jesus and earliest leaders of our way, didn't try. They saw a need, they knew that they were the one, they knew that they weren't the ones to address it, and thus they passed it on. There is no question that we must see the pains that surround us. We must be ready to step into those where our gifts can make a difference. All I'm suggesting, however, is that we also must be ready to acknowledge that we can't be all things to all people and that we must be willing to and comfortable with following the lead of the apostles. As we say, I have my things that God has called me to do. And I'm going to let someone else handle this other one. Let's join in prayer together. God of unimaginable providence, care, you are the one who can. You are the sovereign who can be, is, and always will be all things to each and every one of your children. Help us, God, to see the wonder of that gift most clearly. And then help us to have the wisdom to see where in this world you long for us to be the ones to carry it out. Work within us, God. Let your spirit guide us that we may not try to be all things, but that we might have the wisdom and faith to see our place in your work, where we might be a part of your love carried into the lives of your children. In his name, amen. As always, I thank you for the gift of your time being here with me. I hope you have a blessed afternoon, and I look forward to being with you again tomorrow at noon. Have a great afternoon.